Okay, we have started talking about monochromators. Now, what's the function of monochromators so that we are clear of what, what we're talking about here? What is the use of the monochromators? To select the particular wavelength To select a particular wavelength, okay? That's why it's wavelength selector. What's the other wavelength selector? What's the other kind of wavelength selector? One is monochromator, the one before this? Grating, filters. Filters, monochromator. Then when we get to monochromators, two kinds of monochromators. One based on the prism, the other based on the grating. Uh, prism works on the fact that you know when it goes through when the light goes through a change in medium air glass air where the index refractive index of air is different compared to that of the prism material so you are going to get uh, if the original radiation is uh, comprised of more than one wavelength, what we get is the wavelengths are going to be um, refracted into different directions. And that's what we want. We want the different wavelengths to be um, refracted into different directions so that we can now choose which one we want to leave the exit slit. Okay? So then we are going to now look at gratings based on the same idea although how it works with the grating and how it works with the prism is somewhat different but the overall function is again to have the different wavelengths uh, come out in different directions okay to isolate a particular wavelength first kind of grating e shellet because there's another one e shell okay so distinguish between the two e shellet and e shell gratings so what are these gratings actually these gratings are um, a relatively shiny surface with where is my description of gratings Don't have the greetings here. No description of the greetings. So this is a cross section of the grating, a side view, okay? And um, a grating will have many lines. So an example in the problem given here is where a particular grating used in the UV or uh, uh, UV or visible region contains. 2,500 lines in 1 nanometer so can you imagine 1 nanometer is what? 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters and you have these fine lines 2,500 of them so blazes also is equivalent to lines so you might find it being described as blazes or lines okay and so the number of gratings will be different. Let's say that the gratings used in the infrared region will be different, different in the number of lines that are going to be required of the grating. So we are looking now at the cross section and these grooves. And that's another word. You can say 2,500 grooves, blazes, lines. They mean the same thing. So this. The valleys here is what are called the grooves or the number of lines. So here you say one line, two lines, three lines, etc. Okay. And in the Ishalat grating, the incident light falls on the broad surface. So on this grating, uh, on this grating surface, we have a broad surface and a, a, a narrow, a steeper surface. For the Ishalat, the incident radiation falls on the broader surface compared to the E shell, okay, E C H E L L E, which will be looked later on. The narrower, steeper side is used. 
where the incident radiation will fall on the steeper, steeper side of the um, uh, grating surface. Like we had a, a, an equation for your filters, how the filter selects a particular wavelength dependent on the thickness of the dielectric layer. Here, it is now dependent on D, where as shown here, D is the distance between the two lines on the grating. So if you are told just now, you have in one nanometer, you have 2,500 lines. So you are supposed to calculate D. D will be one over 2,500 uh, uh, nanometers. Okay. So from the density of the lines or blazes or grooves given for a particular grating, we then can calculate D. So D is going to be a characteristic of the grating use. If you now have incident radiation falling on the grating surface at angle I, incident angle, so I is fixed, what we find is, again, we have this N, the order, where N is 1, 2, 3, integers. Okay, you have your first order, second order, similar to the filters. So if we take the simplest, where N equals to 1 first order, we find that at a particular I, okay, you, you send the radiation at a particular angle, I, I is fixed. D is fixed because of uh, the particular grating that you use. So we find that when we uh, look at this equation which must be obeyed by the radiation falling onto the grating, the and being diffracted. So we have the beam incident on the grating surface and then diffracted. It's not a mirror, okay? Mirror is reflection. Here is diffraction. Something happens uh, on the surface of the grating. So if that comes out at angle R, what we find is different wavelengths will come out at different I. Because the left hand side must be equal to the right hand side. So if D is fixed, I is fixed, for different lambda, you get different R, which is what you want. Okay? Different wavelengths to come out of this grating at different angles, to be separated. If they all came out the same angle, then there's no separation between the different wavelengths. But this diagram, of course, is showing a monochromatic beam. What do you understand by monochromatic? Mono, mono means one. So, monochromatic is one wavelength, one wavelength. So that you can do the maths on how to understand how the grating works. So monochromatic, which means this is just one wavelength, incident at angle I, and it's going to be diffracted at angle R. What happens is, somewhat similar to the filter, you get interference between beam 1 and 2. You get 100% constructive interference if the path length is n times lambda, okay? An integ integral number of the wavelength. That means if it's different by one wavelength, two wavelength, three wavelengths, then you get constructive interference, which means that wave on a wave, okay? How do you, how do you say that now? That's a word to use. And then you have another one right on top. Maybe this, maybe this first one started here, and then another one started here. But they're all the uh, peaks match. Okay, they are in phase, one hundred percent in phase. Okay, so hundred percent constructive interference because the amplitude will be double. On the other hand, one hundred percent destructive will be if it's out of phase. So a peak is um, a peak of one wave is uh, I hate I lose that word. what's that word something you know you know when one something is uh, superimposed okay let's use superimposed 
I cannot find the word that I want to use. If one wave is superimposed such that the peak matches the valley. Okay, so plus added to a minus will be zero. So no light. 100% constructive interference, brightness, intensity increase. Okay. So essentially, you're looking at beams one and two, and they will travel at different distances, as you can uh, will see here. One, and then take two. What's the difference in the path length? The distance travel between one and two. If it's n times lambda, you have constructive interference. If it's not out of phase, it will be uh, some destructive interference. Okay, totally out of phase, zero. And to test your trigonometry, you know, cos cos an angle equals y over x sine angle equals x over x over r whatever you you do it on your own which is the best way for you to understand how it works so that um, we know that the difference in the path length so what we want to see is look at the distance traveled by one and two and we will find out that the difference between one and two is equal to this the length of cb and bd which re referring to that diagram is now so the difference in the path length must be n times lambda if maximum constructive interference is supposed to occur. And by using the different triangles and using your uh, trigonometry, we will find that you will then um, come up with this equation that n times lambda must be equal to d sine r plus sine r. All it is, is based on this idea that the difference in the path length must be n times lambda. So as we've said just now, first order, we will see it coming out at certain r. Second order, uh, sorry, no. n equals 1, lambda will come out at a certain r. Unfortunately, just like the filters, interference filters, we also get second order radiation. I must remember not to beam this thing through somebody's eyes. Maybe I want you to do it actually, okay? If we were to find that, let's say, um, n equals to 1, you get lambda coming out at a certain r. When you put n equals to 2, what will happen? get lambda coming out at a certain certain value uh, certain value of r where this is the angle angle of diffraction and this is where n equals to 1 n equals to 2 and let's just say this is a you know make it simple 600 nanometers will come out at angle R Diffracted off the surface of the grating Okay, So at angle R, we get 600 If you work out the same thing If you get, if you put now N equals to 2 You are going to get that What same wavelength will come out at R Right side, R, I and R are the same But now put it N equals to 2 what value will lambda be so that you still get it obeying the equation? 300. 1 times 600 equals 600. Okay, so you get a certain i. D and i are fixed. So it will come out at a certain r. But if you put n equals to 2, 2 times 300 will still make you 600, will still give you the same answer here. That means... 300 will also come out at R So at that same angle Again you have this um, Mixing of different wavelengths First order and the higher order wavelengths And similarly you know 
uh, with n equals to 3, what will it be? What wavelength will come out at R? 200. Okay? And all this will be coming out at the same angle R. So you have uh, first power, you have 600 nanometers coming out. You, if you were your eye were here, you can know all these different nanometers. And you also have the second order, which is 300 nanometers. Third order, which will be 200. So all coming out same wavelength, at same angle. But we said the, the, the reason why we want to use the grating is so that different wavelengths come out at different R. So now this is again a problem where uh, even using the grating, you have to get rid of the higher order wavelengths, higher order diffracted light coming out of the grating. Usually, n equals to 1 is the most intense. So there must be some other way uh, to get rid of the higher order wavelengths. Let's spend... Everybody has brought a calculator, right? Rather than just listening to me. I'm sure 12 o'clock is not uh, the best time to have a class. Or have you done it already? Okay, let's do it now. Everybody knows how to use sign on the calculator? Because it's been a long time. Diffraction grating is 2,500 blazes per nanometers. So what we want now is what is the wavelength at first order, which means n equals to 1. Reflection angle I is 5. Uh, sorry, reflection R is 5, I is 50 degrees. So what is that wavelength at first order? First of all, you have to calculate D. What is D? 1 over 2005, which is? 4 times 10 to minus 4 units, nanometers. Okay, so that the remember the equation is? D sine I plus sine R. I is given, R is given. Do you know N is equal to 1? So what is, the, what is the wavelength coming out at reflection angle 5, 5 degrees? Forgot how to use sign. Make sure I think there's some probably there's some uh, when you use sign whether you want it to be in degrees or radians or whatever, right? Make sure you have it in the sign right in it. So okay, okay, everybody who's got an answer? How many nanometers? What wavelength is it that's coming out at reflection angle five degrees? What is it? 300 and? 314. 341. Everybody else got that? What have you got here? Here? What was the problem? What is the problem? Very small number. N times lambda, which is D, which is what? 3 times 10 minus 4, you said. Sine I, which is incident, is what? 50 degrees.
What what is the problem? Um Oh my goodness. Distance between the blazers. Okay, you're given it's 2,500 lines per nanometer. So that means 1 over... We'll give you nanometers because 1 nanometer so many lines. So, it's a small number. This must be... 0, 0.0 something. Okay, so the next one is um, what is the wavelength at second order? Same I, same R. How would you do it? Just divide it by two. Three, four, what is this now? Three, four, one. Three, four, one nanometers. Divided by two. And the third one is assuming now you still have an incident angle of 50. Now we want to know at what angle will 290 nanometers come out. So the wavelength that is going to be diffracted from the grating is 290 nanometers at first order. N equals to 1, uh, lambda is 290. I is 50, you calculate what R is. Okay. On your own time. Okay, so essentially that is an shell at how it works. So the the downside to it is similar to the filters, you get different orders of wavelength coming out at a particular R. So at one angle R, you get first order, second order, third order, and they are all different wavelengths. This is in the visible region. This is in the UV. This is in the UV. Okay. These different values mean different wavelengths. So now when we go to the E shell, E shell monochromators, what it does now is you have the grating. The difference just now we said that for the for the ishellet you use the broader surface. For the ishell you use the, the narrower surface. Okay? But the idea the overall idea for the ishell grating or monochromator is such that now you have in combination with the grating you now have a prism and what the prism does is to separate these separate these different orders which are different wavelengths because we have seen the prism can separate different wavelengths right so now you use a combination grating plus prism double dispersion the grating splits up first or, uh, first round and the prism then splits the different orders so each angle the you it coming out at the same angle but now it's spread into again a different dimension okay so which is what is shown here you get the wavelengths coming out <coughs> at an angle where each line now we say if we look here we trace down one line is made up of more than one order and with the use of the prism all those different orders are now split up by the grating so if you want to see that you know this this group of lines is at a particular r from the grating similar this one so they are all different orders with different wavelengths so that's why it's shown here diffraction order <coughs> where it's shown here in fact you you don't work with n equals one and n equals two you are working with higher orders when you use the shell grating if you see here order 58 78 n equals 58 78 98 118 so you use the higher order wavelengths so we have two dispersing elements the grating the e shell grating plus a prism
and as we have said, we use uh, the Ishell grating uses the short, the steeper, the shorter surfaces of the blazers. And you use the higher order diffractions, n equals 20 to 120. So if you were to be at the end of the here, if you were to if you were to be the capturing the picture at this end, what you get is this two-dimensional spectrum. Where here it's separated. The different wavelengths are separated due to the dispersion from the grating. And if you remember, at each particular angle, you have different orders, which is now separated by the prism into the different orders. So at each wavelength, at each R from the grating, you have different orders, which is now then split up. Of course, they don't show n equals 1, n equals 2. They show now in terms of wavelength. Okay? So that's why you have... Here you are shown the n, and here are shown the wavelengths. So now we can choose... Uh, since it's spread out, it spreads out the wavelengths, perhaps we can use um, 380 at order 80. Or we can use... 520 at order 60, you know. So different wavelength, same wavelengths. I mean the 280 here. Uh, or okay, let's compare it to something. Okay, the 500 here and the 500 here is the same. Light at 500 nanometers. It's just now is being uh, given out. You know the uh, different order. This one will be order sixty. This one will be order seventy. But it's same wavelength. Blue light is blue light. Okay, nothing different. So y what you have here is a greater dispersion. So in case in your sample you have two wavelengths which are very close to one another, so we can now choose the different wavelengths but using different orders so that they are further apart. Okay. So two kinds of monochromators, Ishelet, Ishel, the monochromators using the grating. How do we now talk about the quality? You know, quality of light coming out from the monochromator based on the grating. Depends on four factors: purity of the radiant output, resolution, light gathering power, spectral bandwidth. When we talk about purity. We say that when you, when you go to um, an instrument, how to change the wavelength may be of uh, some uh, different ways. The more classical way is to have a knob which you change and you look at the wavelength reading. So you change the knob in order to, uh, so that the meter reads the wavelength that you want to choose. Or you use uh, it through a computer to a microprocessor, you know, you, where you set the wavelength in that way. So when, once you set the wavelength, you are assuming that if you set at 3 to 4 nanometers, for example, the light that comes out of the monochromator is 3 to 4. But because of certain um, incidences, the light coming out from the monochromator may not be at 3 to 4 maybe uh, you know some other totally different wavelengths 500 for example and so those um, light which coming out which is not the same wavelength as what you have uh, fixed the monochromic uh, set the monochromator at uh, what uh, is termed as stray radiation okay exit beams contaminated what with some stray radiation or scattered radiation <coughs> So this scattered or this stray radiation has a wavelength totally different from your chosen wavelength, from your set wavelength, which you have set. And how do you get this stray radiation or scattered radiation is um, 
with time, your different optical components, your monochromator with your lenses, your mirrors and whatnot are all enclosed, okay? But over time, I mean, you know, with the walls of the internal walls uh, de degrading or something, you get dust and whatnot. So these things might fall on the lenses or the mirrors, which then cause the reflection from components that which are not supposed to reflect light, okay? Because if you have dust particles, you know, they will scatter light. So because of all these things happening, you might get something coming out of the exit slit which has a wavelength different from the one you set. As when it's different, it's called stray radiation, okay? So the quality of the monochromator will be dependent on the percentage of stray radiation that, you get, that comes out for that monochromator. So the higher the percentage of stray radiation, the lower the quality. Second, resolution. The whole purpose of the monochromator was you split different wavelengths in different directions. Why? Because you want to distinguish. We want only to detect a certain wavelength. But if the wavelengths are too close to one another, it might come to a point that you cannot, the monochromator cannot distinguish. They are too close to one another. Okay, on the focal plane, it's too close. So it cannot, so that's what, what you talk, uh, what is meant by resolution. When you talk about resolution of a monochromator, is the ability to distinguish wavelengths which are close, very close to one another. And this depends on the grating, the dispersion, how the grating splits up the Dispers dispersion is, you know, dispersing the different wavelengths in different directions. So how well the grating does that will then um, influence the resolution of the monochromator. How do you then judge the resolution? Through the angular dispersion, linear dispersion and resolving ultimately the resolving power of that monochromator. That's what I told you to read up. Okay angular dispersion so these are all characteristics of the grating used angular dispersion is <coughs> change in r uh, as a function of the wavelength so that's given by dr d <coughs> lambda which is <coughs> n divided by d cos r okay that's angular dispersion how the different <coughs> angles are split with respect to wavelength. An easier way to see how the different wavelengths are dispersed is linear dispersion. Okay, linear dispersion is, oh I have to do something about this one. You know, I mean it cannot be seen yet, it's seen on your tiny, tiny thing. Linear dispersion is variation of wavelength as a function of distance. Okay, so it is d to the negative 1 and it is D cos R over NF, where F will be focal length. Remember, when we had the... To go back in time. Go back in... Um, monochromator, monochromator, yes. Here, or here rather, here. Exit slit. Now we're talking of the exit slit, because it's at the exit slit that you have your different wavelength dispersed in different directions. So the focal length is referring to the whatever mirror or lens that you use to focus the thing onto the exit slit plane containing the exit slit. So we see that linear dispersion is dependent on the focal length as well as the grating. D is a characteristic of the grating. D negative 1 will then be in nanometers per millimeter. So, from the units, we can see how uh, the different wavelengths are dispersed. That means if you have a grating with a linear dispersion of. I don't, I don't. Let's say, you know, nanometers per millimeter. So, these are values for D negative 1 linear dispersion compared to something that is let's say double that so imagine you are in the fo that exit slit plane the 
plane containing the exit slit in one millimeter the spread is 300 nanometers compared to one millimeter you have 600 so in that same distance you squeeze 600 compared to in that same distance you have only 300 the spread is 300 so which one has a better dispersion which one will be for which case will for which grating will the wavelength be spread uh, more Six. 600 300 because in take one inch lah one inch 600 compared to one inch 300 of course kalau 300 more they will be spread they will be spread more okay if you have one one millimeter you have a 300 compared to if you squeeze 600 because now we're talking about resolution we're talking about can it distinguish wavelengths next to each other so if it's all going to be squeezed in one more compression, that means resolution will be lower because they're too close to one another compared to 300, it's more spread out. So you can distinguish. I mean, if you were in a sandwich, you know, you have like say six people here. Ah, uh, I mean, that's better. Six people trying to sit here compared to three. Of course, I can distinguish. Oh, A, B, C. Six people, I cannot distinguish. Maybe I just see all six as one lump. Something like that, okay? Where the, the people here are the different wavelengths. So it's easier to see dispersion, uh, linear dispersion compared to angular, okay? Because you see the spread on the focal plane containing the exit slit. And uh, back to that. So we, we can calculate this for a particular grating. So you want to compare this monochromator with another monochromator. If you know the focal you know the F, you know D, so you can calculate uh, what the linear dispersion is for that particular monochromator. The last one is to actually calculate the resolving power. Remember, resolving the ability to distinguish neighboring wavelength close to one another. So how can you, we can now calculate R, which refers to the resolving power. Um, where it's equals to if we are trying to look at two wavelengths A and B can I can this monochromator distinguish A and B so I want to calculate what is the resolving power what is the power needed for that monochromator to be able to distinguish between A and B so I take the average of A and B here I'm, look, I'm looking at two wavelengths okay A and B I take the average divided by the difference and I get certain R so that monochromator the resolving power must be that number in order to be able to distinguish between A and B if the monochromator the value of R for that monochromator is lower means it cannot distinguish A and B anything higher yes so for um, the question can be such that given two wavelengths what is the R required to be able to distinguish between those two? Um, and we're not talking about 300 and 600. We're talking about maybe 340.12 and 340. Point, I don't know, 21 or something like that. Very close, okay? Something like that. So now, can the monochromator distinguish between these two? Calculate the R. Then if, you would, if, the, if the R for that particular monochromator is known, so here you calculate R for AB. R of the monochromator must be higher. Higher than the value you calculate using those numbers. If the R is lower, means you cannot distinguish. Anything higher, if the resolving power of the monochromator is higher than what you calculated, yes, it can resolve those two numbers. What does it mean? It can resolve. The detector can say, oh, 3, 4, uh, 340.12 is this one. Three, can distinguish. Okay? The light due to this will be different from this. No overlap. If it's too close, there will be overlap. You cannot see this. You cannot see, you cannot differentiate between the two. But what is shown here is also um, related to the grating. I mean, this is, this is a bit of optics, but you know, it's something that you should know. Uh, on a big on a macro level uh, that is also related to n 
where N is blazes. Remember what blazes was? Lines on the grating. When the light goes into the monochromator, the grating might be a certain distance. Maybe only part of the light will light up the grating. So, N will be the number of lines which be, will be lighted up on the grating. Maybe not the whole grating will have light falling on it. So, okay. The more, what it's trying to say is, the more light that falls on the grating, the higher the number N will be, the higher the resolving power will be. So, if you were ever to become a chemist, in a position to be able to choose what supplier to buy a particular instrument uh, for, your, for your company, and they say, okay, oh, you know, our instrument, the monochromator, very high resolving power, you know, um, the grating, you know, the, how many length of the grating will be eliminated, I mean, all these kind of things. So you say, oh, okay, okay, that's related to resolution, okay? If ever you come to that position. Okay, resolving power related to something about how much of the grating is being lighted up. And of course, it will improve with longer gratings, more lines on the grating, and if it uses higher diffraction orders. So we're coming to where are we coming to now? We looked at to back up what are we discussing all this for? to see the quality of the monochromators, okay? Purity, resolution, now we go to light gathering power. Light gathering must be dependent on the lenses or focal length. And it's dependent on the F number, F over number, which is the focal length divided by the diameter of the column meeting mirror. If you still have your classical uh, what you call those kind of cameras where you have to adjust well, it's not auto, you have to adjust, you have to set whatever, you know so that you get the right focus then you probably know something about F numbers but I guess nowadays you don't need to know but anyway, this is related to the focal length and the diameter of the column meeting mirror so the more light it gathers, of course the better, okay the more light because um, a monochromator with F over two gathers four times more light. The more light that goes into monochromator, the more light that comes out. Because remember, in the monochromator itself, it's already being subdivided. All these kind of things are happening. So you want as the light gathering power to be high so that you can distinguish between signal and noise. Noise means very low level signals. And the last is spectral bandwidth. Bandwidth of the radiation that is output by the monochromator. Remember this diagram? We said that you can set your monochromator at 3 to 4, but it's not going to be one single line that comes up from the monochromator. It's going to be um, light which, is, which has a maximum uh, transmittance at your set wavelength but you will also have some wavelengths of light below that set wavelength and above where we said that halfway is called effective bandwidth so this effective bandwidth how large or small it is is dependent on the monochromator dependent on the exit slit that you use the exit slit for uh, exit and entrance slit in your monochromator so why, maybe before going into details about this, why is this effective bandwidth so important? In, in our trying to distinguish between different, uh, different wavelengths is the narrower the line, that means you can distinguish between the lines. Okay, effective bandwidth. If you have fat, the same A and B, the bigger the effective bandwidth, you will get some overlap. It means you cannot distinguish between A and B that well, compared to if it's the effective bandwidth is smaller. And with that, I think that's it for today.